So you left a really interesting post on uh, Facebook last week. You said you'd taken a commercial property off grid. Must be fairly unusual. Uh, yeah, it's really the first one. Um, we've been sort of doing a few grid defectors over the past four or five years. Um, often people who leave the grid are doing it for ideological reasons, uh, never for economic reasons. Um, we came across a customer who just wanted more power over a swirl line. They were using about 200 kilowatt hours a day in their home, um, you know, big house, lots of energy use. Um, they just wanted a bit more and uh, going from a swirl line to three phase was going to cost 600,000 of network infrastructure upgrade. So that's the beginning of this um, story actually, because that customer left the grid of their, um, their residential property so that they could have a decent sized um, capacity. Uh, we put in a 45 kilowatt three phase cell electronic SP Pro, um, 46 kilowatts of solar uh, and cut the tie with the grid. Well, the customer liked it so much, he thought he'd do it to his factory. So he's got a commercial premises that's mostly IT based, but um, there's a fair base load of small appliances as well. Um, it wasn't the heavy industry by any means. I think the daily consumption of the factory was 96 kilowatt hours a day. Uh, so we sized a system that could take that factory off grid. Now this is a case of partly it's, I like it. I like to be independent. Partly it's, um, uh, reliability of power because this business is IT based um, you know it's not just keeping your servers online it's keeping your dozen in-house staff online as well uh, so they wanted a, a pretty big backup system but they also thought well why don't we just generate our own power so that's kind of how we got to this point is uh, doing a commercial system um, grid defected what <clears throat> so you must be pretty confident that this off-grid system is reliable because what the consequences for you if there's a, there's a fault and he loses power? Well, to be fully transparent, um, he's not actually turning off his supply completely. He's still got the grid, but he's not using it. So there is a changeover switch. Ah. So still paying a, um, a connection fee uh, and uh, having the option to switch back via a, a changeover switch. But basically, it's a very reliable load. Um, at 96 kilowatt hours a day is the energy consumption, the loads are about four kilowatts on average. So we could just look at the worst case scenarios for solar over the, any, you know, any period of uh, two or three days uh, for the last 10 or 20 years using um, design software like my software, Solar Plus, uh, and then model it based on that. But of course we do have the option for a generator backup because it is an off-grid system. Um, and if it proves that that's required for reliability purposes, uh, we could choose to do that as well. And the third option is actually just using the um, legacy grid via a rectifier as a battery charging source. So the, the legacy grid provides uh, a means to charge the off-grid system uh, without being interactive. This is a, a critical regulatory um, component of the design. You can't just throw an interactive system onto the grid uh, without a lot of approvals. And uh, this system being over 30 kVA would have required grid uh, central protection, a, a GPU as often they're called, uh, and that would have added about $10,000 to the cost of the system and not even really want to do it, not wanting to export energy at all. So uh, we chose not to go down that path, uh, just keep it completely independent from the grid and only using the grid as a battery charging source via rectifiers. Well, <coughs> what's the... Uh why the rectifier is important. Okay, so um, the inverters we use were the Cell Electronic SP Pro 15 kilowatt units, uh, 120 volt battery model, and uh, it is possible to connect them to the grid. They're 4777 part two approved, so you can connect them to the grid, but uh, that would have required you know, some extra regulatory requirements. And uh, if we choose not to connect into the grid, uh, we then have that possibility that there is insufficient renewables for some reason. Like, you know, even though I've, we've modeled the loads quite carefully, something could change in the future. They're putting a bigger split system in, the, in one of the offices and it's just too much uh, for the amount of energy stored. So we can use rectifiers as a way of being only a load as far as the grid's concerned. It's not bi-directional. So a rectifier can only take AC power and, and output DC. Right. It can't reverse that process. So as far as the utility would be concerned, um, it, all they would see is a consumer who uses less power. 
um, well, virtually none actually, uh, except when there's been a mishap perhaps, and uh, the rectifiers are required for topping up the battery. Was, was it hard to convince the grid that this wouldn't be interactive, that it wouldn't feed power back into the grid and to treat you differently and not need the over 30K grid protection measures? Well, frankly, we don't even have to ask them. <laughs> so like, <laughs> if, you, if, you install, um, if you install a new air conditioner in your office, you don't have to ask the grid operator, is it okay for me to put in an air conditioner? Well, a rectifier right, is it's below. Alive. Just a load. Yep. And if you happen to have in your premises some other equipment that stores and generates electricity but doesn't connect to the grid, it's got nothing to do with them. All these kind of systems, um, the death spiral accelerator, uh, it makes it possible <laughs> to start to move away from the grid and use it more and more as the legacy. Yeah. So, what kind of batteries did you use on this grid? Well, this was an unusual job to specify because the, um, the customer actually imports batteries, uh, small ones, but the, the, the company he imports them from makes enormous batteries. So he used his own supplier, um, a battery I know nothing about, it's uh, GCS from China. Um, they look fairly budget batteries. So I was pretty nervous about them, but I made sure that that wasn't covered by any of our work, that the fact that the warranty on the batteries was his because he supplied them. Um, there are two and a half thousand amp hour sealed lead acid batteries in one string of 60 cells, which makes it a, um, an LV system, 120 volt system. So uh, if, you were, <clears throat> if you were specifying the battery, would you choose lead acid still? Um, probably not. Uh, I think I'd go for, it would still probably be a price premium for a job like this um, to go to the lithium options, but uh, I think I, I would go for um, lithium because of its characteristics and that we can, be, uh, it's more tolerant of partial state of charge cycling, for instance. So we don't have to make sure that we're um, going through a complete re recharge cycle as you do with lead acids uh, to make sure the absorption process is complete and that the batteries are not sulfating. So they need a, a lot more um, TLC, as it were, in terms of your system design to, to make sure that they perform well. Um, do you want to have a little look at it? We were just doing the commissioning. That's Jerry Robinson from the Greenhouse Effect there, um, installing the ABBs, the six kilowatt String inverters. Um, How many did you do ABB? Aha, <laughs> the Fronius drought. <laughs> yeah, so right. Actually, okay. In my design, I specified Fronius. Um, we just couldn't get them, and uh, the client was impatient for this to happen, so we just switched to ABB. Frankly, I'm I'm not disappointed. Um, I don't. I know ABB have had their bad points in the you know bad moments in the past with the E031 era. Um, that was a previous model. This looks a complete redesign. There's almost no similarity apart from the colour and the label. Um, so, I'm, you know, I imagine they've, they've addressed those concerns about that, that fault. Um, uh, they're very easy to commission. Uh, I, was, I was extremely pleased with the, the process. Uh, and also the documentation from Selectronic, because these are managed AC coupled inverters, uh, meaning that the, the Selectronic converter has a comms cable, RS485 cable, connecting to all of those ABB inverters and directly power controls them. Because it's, it's important in an off-grid situation that if you've got AC coupling, uh, you have to have a way of throttling back your, your solar inverters whenever the battery's full and the loads are light. So you've got to control them very fast too. So millisecond response time with managed AC coupling. Um, sorry, I've just switched slides. You might have noticed so you can see what the batteries look yeah, like. This is actually... Batteries. This is um, his home system, right? This is not the factory. This is the home system. Just a little old, you know, hybrid system for your house. <laughs> um, raw numbers there, 300 kilowatt hours of um, storage, uh, 15, three times 15 kilowatt um, SP pros, that's 45 kilowatts, three phase. Uh, there's seven eight, Fronius 8.2s on his home because uh, we actually allowed for a bit of expansion. And that's all, that's in, in, the, in the build process. So we actually have covered in all those batteries. Don't freak out. They weren't just open there in a shed. That's all been covered in. So this is just the uh, construction process. Wow. So have you got any more commercial clients looking to go off grid? Um, well, you know, until this happened, I didn't think it would ever be a thing. Uh, but I'm, I'm starting to see opportunities for that where energy security is a, a critical requirement and loads are manageable. That's the key thing. 
Uh, so, for instance, medical centres that have uh, vaccines that are stored uh, in fridges. I mean, sure, you could put in a UPS system just for those vaccines, uh, but they're often quite big fridges. So it's not just a, a little, you know, UPS system from JCAR or something. It's going to be a, you know, cabinet-mounted system, quite expensive. So if you're going to put in some solar and you wanted a backup system, why not actually make it big enough to, to run the facility as well, or at least part of it? And that's where that term I, I threw in at the beginning, um, the grid defector, which means you start to take part of the installation off grid. You don't just take the whole thing off grid and you segregate them uh, through rectifiers. So the rectifier is the only connection to the grid that's providing a charging source to the, you know, an air quotes off grid system, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. allowing it to have reliability, but to be completely independent. Are you seeing any residential customers who are constrained by the DNSP's connection requirements taking part of the house off grid so, so they can add more solar? Um, yes, absolutely. And I think that's where I, the, the term I, I kind of dreamt up some years ago um, came about because of customers being frustrated that, you know, they might have had five or six kilowatts of uh, inverter power installed in an area where the, the, that's about the maximum they're allowed and they just want more and they're being told they can't by the DNSP. So they start to think of ways of getting around it. One way to do it, and I'm gonna say around it legally, um, is to have an independent system that isn't interactive with the grid. So um, there are even products, small scale products that are perfect for this. Um, there's a very, very budget inverter model called MPP Solar, sometimes called MPP PIP or various other names that it's OEM under, you know, a five kilowatt unit, one of those comes in under about $900 Australian. And it's got a yeah, well, you know, three MPPPs built into um, the smaller model and uh, one MPP in the larger model, uh, operating up to 550 volts on the solar array. It's fully um, capable of running independently. It's got generator um, start capability but it has no interactivity with the grid. It's only got a rectifier on its input. So that makes it possible to install it as a independent power system, using the grid only as a legacy charging source when there's insufficient solar and battery storage. Yeah, so if the, if the DNSP's connection requirements don't increase as people's loads increase, as we get you know, electric cars and stuff, that's, uh, that's an interesting way to fill your roof with solar and to hell with the DNSP. Yeah, I think of it as direct appliance solar too. So it could be solar PV that heats water, um, solar PV that directly charges an electric car, uh, not through through an inverter, but uh, a, a direct DC um, charging source. Um, pool pumps, so solar pools, um, even solar air conditioners, a few of those out there, which are um, powered from, from a small solar array. So taking appliance level solar uh, as a way of adding more without being caught up with the DNSP's um, IES limits. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, no. we'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I must defend the DNSP's on this one though, because I, I do sit on a standards committee EL42 with them. Um, I mean, they've got real concerns about the amount of hidden load that's starting to uh, um, gather yeah. um, behind solar and batteries. Now, when I say hidden loads. You know, if, if a customer has a big enough PV system to power their home and a big enough battery system to support it overnight, uh, the utility doesn't see that load hardly ever. But when they do see it is when there's a network event, such as frequency or voltage event that causes the inverter to island. And suddenly all those loads um, synchronized across uh, large segments of the grid appear at the same time. And so they've got this problem. It's not just um, a little bit of diversity where one customer turns on a large load and another one hasn't and then you know, alternates a bit. This is, uh, there is a high voltage event and every single inverter turns off in the street, in the suburb, yeah. or in the case of frequency, in the state. Uh, and if you consider the gigawatts of capacity we now have on the NEM, if we had a frequency event, it would just shut the whole NEM down. Well, because they've, they've always managed the grid in the past, it's always been manageable because of the inherent randomness of everyone switching their stuff on at different times. Yeah, and <laughs> inverters that react to grid events. Yeah. Synchronize yep. all the loads. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, when it happens, which is probably inevitable, we'll, uh, we'll, see. we'll see how um, these uh, people respond. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It actually has happened in Victoria um, about seven years ago. We had a small event, an earthquake, 
in the Latrobe Valley and it caused the uh, large coal-fired power station generators to wobble for a moment, which caused a frequency variation, which caused all of the solar inverters in eastern um, Victoria to turn off at the same time in the middle of the day. Fortunately, back then, the, the capacity was quite small, and I think it was about a three or 400 megawatt step change that they saw. So they saw effectively three or 400 megawatts suddenly appear on the grid within two seconds. Now that's like a smelter mm -hmm. throwing four pots on all at once. So that probably freaked them out in the SCADA, on, you know, looking at this, this SCADA system. Um, and then 60 seconds later, back it comes again, uh, the generation. So they suddenly see a drop of three to 400 megawatts. Now that, that was small back then, now it's gigawatts. Now it's gigawatts, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's gonna be very interesting. Well, that's fascinating, that's fascinating, Glenn. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. I've, um, I've never really thought too hard about um, big facilities going off grid, but um, and especially the rec using the rectifiers to make it look like a load instead of interactive. That's that's really interesting. Hmm. And they're actually very cheap too, rectifiers. So it's uh, yeah, they have a sure. simple job to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, people have more options than they realise actually when they when they hit the uh, you know five five or ten kilowatt inverter limit. Yeah, that's awesome. So you're uh, so your customer that's taken his home and his uh, office, his factory off grid. How's he? How's he enjoying the off grid life? So his house has been off grid for, oh, I think about two years now. So he's gone through one and a half winters. Um, uh, he initially had a very high load. I think it was around about 190 kilowatt hours a day. Um, but as soon as he was had moved off grid, even though we sized the system appropriately, he started to think more conservatively about, well, making it stretch further before he had to worry about, do I need to run a backup generator or not? So he also halved his energy consumption through just energy efficiency using his finger, you know, wow. switch it off, <laughs> turn off some of those splits that you're not using in rooms that you don't live in all the time. So um, yeah, that, that was an interesting learning experience. Also, Giving them really good monitoring. We used um, RVO's Emax, which is a monitoring solution that works beautifully with uh, Selectronics SP Pro. And so he mon self monitors the system closely. Um, so going from a customer who would have got a bill every three months and just, you know, automatically paid it and never thought about it to someone who's actually thinking about their energy consumption. Yeah, right. It makes it real. It makes it much more real to them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. And how, how long has his factory, his factory been off grid? Uh, well, <laughs> we're just completing it right now. So we'll be doing commissioning tests uh, next weekend, actually. So it's really just about to happen. Cool. Exciting times. Well, thanks for that, Glenn. That's fascinating, mate. Yeah. Pleasure, Finn. <laughs>